Adam Becker has written a brilliant book, What is Real? And there's also a YouTube video from his talk at Google. He reviews the history of quantum mechanics, the best historical uh, account that I have ever read on that subject, and makes two points. Number one, the quantum mechanics as a body of mathematics is enormously successful. The, in, the entire high-tech economy that we have, uh, my iPhone, the internet, everything, this camera, your computer, everything comes out of quantum mathematics. And yet there is a problem. Somehow, the quantum world tells us something profound about this world that we live in. And the question how to understand our world based on quantum mechanics is an unanswered question. Becker knows a vast amount about most everything having to do with this subject, with the exception that he does not seem to know about the theory of elementary waves. And the purpose of this video is to explain the theory of elementary waves. The theory of elementary waves is based on the strange assumption that waves and particles go in opposite directions. Particles follow zero energy waves backwards. Now this seems preposterous, but then again, every solution to the measurement problem is somewhat preposterous. And uh, this solution turns out to be less preposterous than most any other one, in my opinion. TEW is not an interpretation of quantum mechanics. Even though it shares the same mathematics as quantum mechanics, it is not an interpretation because there are six experiments for which TEW and quantum mechanics predict divergent outcomes. Of these six, two have been conducted, and the results of those two can be explained by the theory of elementary waves and cannot be explained by quantum mechanics. What are those two? Well, one is a neutron interferometer experiment published by Kaiser et al., and the other is a double slit experiment. I'm not going to describe those experiments or show that Quantum mechanics cannot explain them, but TEW can, because it is much better explained already on my YouTube video called Solution to the Central Mystery of Quantum Mechanics, a video which really explains the foundations of why we say that waves and particles go in different directions and makes that assumption understandable. Consider a man holding a pistol and aiming it at a target. When do you think that wave function collapse occurs? In other words, when do you think all the probabilities for that bullet collapse into one definite reality? Does it occur when the bullet hits the target, which is apparently what quantum mechanics would have you believe? Or does it happen when the gun is fired? Well, in my opinion, it happens when the gun is fired. All the different probabilities for that bullet mostly collapse into one definite reality. Even though the bullet might wobble a little bit during flight, it collapses into one definite reality when the gun is fired. This is a picture of Gavrilo Princip shooting the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria on June 28, 1914. There was immediate wave function collapse. In fact, all of Europe collapsed into World War I. 16 million people died. No one, no one said the bullet was in a superposition, could have been anywhere, and when wave function collapse occurred, it happened that the bullet appeared inside the skull of the Archduke. They blame the Serb student because wave function collapse happened when the gun was fired. Given that in the real world, wave function collapse occurs when a gun is fired and not when it hits the target, how did quantum mechanics get off on the wrong foot saying that wave function collapse occurs when it hits the target? Well, 
In the first place, that's because the toxic effects of logical positivism in the first half of the 20th century. But in addition, it's because quantum mechanics has got it all wrong by the assumption that waves and particles are going in the same direction. I demolished that assumption in my 17-minute YouTube video solution to the central mystery of quantum mechanics. If wave function collapse occurs when the gun is fired, that implies that information is streaming into the gun prior to that event. So before the student pulled the trigger, he observed that this is the crown prince of Austria. For 90 years, quantum experts have assumed that waves and particles go in the same direction and for 90 years they have been unable to solve the measurement problem. Perhaps it is now time to at least consider the other starting assumption that waves and particles don't go in the same direction. TEW can accomplish something else which I believe is quite remarkable. It can show you the mechanism behind the quantum mathematics. In other words, quantum mathematics has always appeared to be very, very abstract and people could not figure out how it related to everyday reality, but it does. I'm going to show you the geometry of elementary waves and show you how quantum mathematics provides a roadmap of how to understand these elementary waves, but the roadmap is written in hieroglyphs. Now we're going to start with a very nice book by Richard Feynman, QED, written for a lay audience. Feynman takes his path integral approach and tries to explain it to lay people without mentioning imaginary numbers, if you will. Feynman, as you know, in his path integral approach, he always likes wiggly lines. I'm going to simplify his argument. I'm going to draw a picture in which there is only one path. I mean, you know, Feynman's approach is to take the amplitude of many different paths that a photon might follow to the detector and then add them all together to find the overall amplitude. I'm going to take just one path and I'm going to take it, make a straight path, unlike the contorted paths that Feynman likes to draw. In the first chapter of his book QED, Feynman tries to explain what an amplitude is to a lay audience without mentioning complex numbers, and he speaks of an amplitude moving out from a photon source, and he talks a lot about tiny spinning arrows, which I'm going to draw in red. Feynman said, quote, to determine the direction of each arrow, let's imagine we have a stopwatch that can time a photon as it moves. This imaginary stopwatch has a single hand that turns very, very rapidly. When a photon leaves the source, we start the stopwatch. As long as the photon moves, the stopwatch hand turns about 36,000 times per inch for red light. When the photon ends up at the detector, we stop the watch. The tiny arrow, which spins and is red, is a representation of the amplitude. The formula for an amplitude you can see on your screen where the absolute value of A is the length of the arrow and theta is the angle of the arrow. So without mentioning imaginary numbers, what Feynman is telling his audience is that you square the length of the arrow in order to discover the probability of a photon taking that path. So to summarize Feynman's model, we have a photon source over here. It's going to send a photon over here to a detector. What is the probability that that will happen? Well, that's the square root of the probability is the amplitude, which is determined by that spinning red arrow. We're going to assume that Feynman made the typical quantum mechanics mistake. He thought that the amplitudes move in this direction centrifugally in the direction that the photons go, 
whereas in fact they move centripetally uh, from the environment towards the photon source. So we're going to have a spinning red arrow which will determine the amplitude that a photon will follow that elementary rate backwards and it comes from the detector to the photon source. So Richard Feynman who has given us so much has also given us our first crude sketch of what an elementary ray might look like. It has a central vector pointing in some direction it's traveling at the speed of light. It has an amplitude which consists of the equations seen on your screen and it has a wavelength or frequency. Obviously if we compare two elementary rays one like that and one like that then the more tightly packed one will carry a higher energy particle. Each particle has a wavelength depending on its energy. So we need a name for our elementary ray. We will call it ASH, the capital letter ASH. ASH refers to an elementary ray without a particle. Most elementary rays do not have a particle involved and are totally invisible to our equipment. We can't see them, we can't feel them. When a particle is riding on an elementary ray, following it in the opposite direction, we will name the particle Pi, capital Pi. In TEW, as in quantum mechanics, we only see wave particles. We never see waves without particles. We never see particles without waves. Our wave particle always has a position and trajectory even before it is observed and the wave and particle part of it are going in opposite directions. In non-relativistic TEW, the number of particles in any space is the same as the number of particles in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But in our theory, there are also an infinite number of elementary waves that are not part of a wave particle, that are just out there and we can't see them, we can't detect them unless they get involved with a particle. By conjuring up an elementary ray, we have established a physical analog of a probability amplitude from quantum math. It is not the elementary ray as a whole which is the physical analog. It is the amplitude of the elementary ray, which is more or less its radius. It is the amplitude which is a complex number of the elementary ray, which is the physical analog of the amplitude from quantum equations. However, as you have no doubt figured out, our first sketch is grossly inadequate. After all, amplitudes do not live in three-dimensional Cartesian space. They live in n-dimensional Hilbert space. So the next task is to define an n-dimensional Hilbert space for our elementary ray. This is easily done. The Hilbert space requires us to have an inner product, and an inner product we have to start with defining an adjoint. An adjoint is very easy to define. If an elementary ray is conceived of as looking like a cylindrical helix or slinky, then its adjoint is coaxial going in the same direction but having the opposite direction of rotation. It is the mirror image of the elementary ray which is the adjoint of the elementary ray. Based on the fact that we can define an adjoint as we have just done, we can define an inner product as you see on your screen. We now need to figure out how to have an n-dimensional, perhaps infinite dimensional, inner product. Well, let's imagine that our photon source is putting out photons of different energies, discrete from one another, like a Balmer series. In this case, a blue photon carrying 2.70 electron volts of energy would follow backwards an elementary ray of wavelength 460 nanometers. On the other hand, a red photon would carry 1.82 electron volts of energy and would follow an elementary ray of 680 
nanometers wavelength. Thus we can define for this Balmer series a set of elementary waves, each of which has a different wavelength and carries a different color photon. Thus we have an n-dimensional Hilbert space because for each one of these n, each one of these wavelengths, we can define an inner product. In summary, I have been trying to sketch out how it might be possible to find a physical analog of probability amplitudes in the world of elementary rays. It is easy to see why math in TEW would be the same as quantum math. Any wave equation is pretty much the same if you reverse the direction of the wave, unless there is entropy. And as far as entropy, energy is a property of particles, not waves. And particles go in what you might call the correct direction, the direction you would expect from quantum mechanics in TEW. As a matter of fact, energy and elementary rays flow in opposite directions. In TEW, time always goes forwards, never backwards. If an elementary ray goes east to west and a particle follows it backwards west to east, the clock keeps ticking forward for both of them. Now, any particle cannot move or exist without being attached to an elementary ray. That's simply the way nature is rigged up. When we divide up the properties of a quantum wave particle, we have to decide which properties to assign to the TEW wave and which properties to assign to the particle. For example, all energy and mass is in the particle, none of it's in the wave. From stern gerlach magnet experiments, I have learned that intrinsic spin is a property of elementary waves, elementary rays. I now want to turn to another subject, which is the Bell test experiments. If you think of all of space being filled with elementary rays going in every direction at the speed of light, that implies that each elementary ray has a mate, namely a coaxial elementary ray going at the speed of light in the opposite direction. We call this a bi-ray, and it turns out that entangled photons, or entang any entangled pair of particles, follow the same bi-ray in opposite directions. Imagine this as a picture of a bi-ray, two slinkies, one red and one blue, threaded together, traveling in opposite directions at the speed of light. And the bi-ray stretches from Alice on the left through a two-photon source to Bob on the right. What sort of two-photon source shall we use? Well, let's, for example, try a calcium cascade, which is what Elaine Aspect used in 1982 to produce two orthogonal photons traveling in opposite directions. Now I want to simplify the model. There's no need in what follows to have slinkies or cylindrical helices. We will just use a vector, a red vector for the elementary ray traveling from right to left towards Alice, a blue vector for the one traveling in the opposite direction. So the red and blue vectors combined form a bi-ray. In this bi-ray model, we're going to make only one assumption, which is that the probability of either photon following the bi-ray is the amplitude of it following one ray times the amplitude of it following the countervailing ray. Based solely on that assumption, no other assumptions, it turns out we can easily show that if Alice is adjusting her equipment to test the photon at polarizer angle theta 1, and Bob is adjusting his to test the photon at polarizer angle theta 2, then the probability of them both seeing a photon simultaneously is sine squared theta 2 minus theta 1. This model is a three-dimensional uh, representation of the sine squared theta 2 minus theta 1 graph. 
on this side here you have Alice's choice of theta 1 on this side here you have Bob's choice of theta 2 and the height of the model from this line up to wherever above it there is a point on the curve is the sine squared theta 2 minus theta 1 so Alice can choose any theta 1 she wants and then that would be equivalent to cutting through this model and creating the blue wall you see. Bob can then choose any theta 2 he wants and the resulting probability of them both seeing a photon simultaneously will be determined by the height of the blue wall. This model is what is found inside the bi ray, everywhere the same. And of course the question arises, so does your theory support local realism or not? Well, what I'm going to say is sort of obvious, which is that the term local realism is a very, very slippery term. It means different things to different people. And you could say that our theory is has local realism, or you could say that it is non-local. Uh, for sure, our theory is not the same as Einstein's local realism because the Bell test experiments proved our theory to be correct and Einstein's theory to be incorrect. Now, you could say that we have local realism in the sense that this model is found inside uh, Alice's equipment. So if you draw a boundary around Alice's equipment, a small boundary, then Alice's results are not affected by anything outside of that boundary and are therefore local. On the other hand, you could say that this theory is non-local because the same model is found inside uh, Bob's equipment. If you listen to talks about the Bell test experiments, you'll hear a lot of nonsense about when Alice makes her choice that sends a signal to Bob and that signal goes faster than the speed of light. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. In the first place, when Alice makes her choice, it, it doesn't send a signal anywhere. The bi ray is already there long before Alice makes her choice. And if there were a signal, then quantum mechanics underestimates the speed of that signal. It is not just that the same signal goes instantaneously to Bob. The signal was there yesterday in the sense that the bi ray was already there before the electricity was turned on. Of course, until you turn on the electricity, you don't know the bi-ray is there because you have to put some photons into the pipeline in order to discover that it is there. But our theory ends up with a lot of different answers than the usual Bell test nonsense. So, in summary, Adam Becker has written a wonderful, brilliant book in which he says more or less that the measurement problem needs to be solved. There are many, many different interpretations of quantum mechanics which try to solve that and, and I presented TEW as a possible solution, one which I find compelling, but it is not an interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's a different view of nature that happens to have the same mathematics. There are two important features of TEW to keep in mind. The first is that our theory says that wave function collapse does not occur when a particle is detected. It occurs when a particle is emitted, when a gun is fired. The second is that our theory provides a rudimentary approach to understanding what quantum mathematics might be describing. The quantum equations are a roadmap to the world of elementary rays, but the roadmap is written in hieroglyphs. I've made a rough approximation first stab at understanding what that map says. Now you might ask, where do I get all these ideas? I just happen to have been born into a family in which I am the cousin of Louis E. Little who established the foundations of TEW. 
which is a game changer. This has had the effect on my mind of being like water running downhill. I keep thinking about new things. I figured out what an elementary ray looks like based on the work of Feynman. Uh, that's some of my own contribution. But basically it was Louis E. Little who came up with the theory.